everyone. Welcome to Little Star Light. I'm one of your hosts, Andrea Yeager, with Little Star Foundation alumni, childhood cancer survivor, Karen Vasquez. Adriana is on location elsewhere. I'm greatly honored to introduce our guest today as the multi-talented, multifaceted, award-winning, faith-driven, gifted creator, director, co-writer, and co-producer of the blockbuster groundbreaking TV series, The Chosen, amongst other great works. Here's the celebrated and devoted to God, Dallas Jenkins. Welcome, Dallas. Thank you for joining us. What a lovely intro. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, it, it continues. Wait till you see this part of the intro. <laughs> for anyone unfamiliar with The Chosen, here is some information. The Chosen provides answers to the question, what does a life with God mean? Miracles happen and declares God is communicating with us. It is the largest crowdfunded media project of all time, will reach over 1 billion views soon, is in hundreds of countries, and is already dubbed in hundreds of languages worldwide. The Chosen reflects people's hearts, brings to life meaningful friendships, love, and authentic, relatable human dynamics with Jesus and his disciples. All biblical, historical, cultural, and religious contexts and any plausible artistic management from Dallas and his creative team are designed to support the truth and intention of the scriptures. Every episode is captivating in scenery, character representation, and dialogue. Even the introduction music sets the stage for an adventure you want to take. Dallas Jenkins' creative genius and tested faith, his wife Amanda's also tireless efforts, and the entire chosen team, a family in itself, they bring alive Jesus and his disciples in a realistic way to become friends and a community with for audiences. And fans are showing up by the hundreds of millions longing for these innate connections. Jesus becomes a Jesus who was always there for each of us the entire time. A Jesus as brother, friend, mentor, and oneness and family and heart. A Jesus that dances along with in treasured celebrations, has an engaging, embracing, goodwill sense of humor, teaches wisely, and walks with steadfast love, service, and arising. The Chosen has engaging, relatable, pivotal moments, wonderful cinematic language, and transcends time by providing important, impactful opportunities to be immersed with keen interest in the life of Jesus, the Gospels, and disciples in ways we as audience members feel are actually on the universally known transformative journey embodied by God's infinite love. We are all given a free invitation to watch The Chosen, thanks to the inspired spirit, courageous heart, and soulful efforts of Dallas Jenkins, his wife, Amanda, and the entire chosen team and family. Congratulations and thank you, Dallas. Let's My start goodness. with- <laughs> You're making me want to watch the show again. That was very, very exciting. I just, I just, I just love it so much and, and just so grateful for what you've done. So let's start with the miracles, the five loaves and two fish, which helps with understanding faith, making the most of what a person has, sharing, and God's ability to provide. You have said it is not your job to feed the 5,000, only to provide the loaves and fish. It is such a great story. Would you please explain for the audience the five and two, how God does impossible math? My goodness, you are, this is, you're so thorough. This is wonderful. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and for the question. And I'm a fan of yours. I actually am a huge uh, sports fan and uh, was reading the Chicago Tribune sports page every day when I, starting when I was five years old. And uh, remember your tennis career, and it's wonderful to see just what you're doing for the Lord since then. So thanks for so much for having me on. So uh, the five and two. Uh, yeah, and I can see behind you, you've got a five and two shirt going. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but in the and percent between the five and two, there's a loaf and a fish mm -hmm. uh, in there. We uh, this, this is the hallmark of our whole organization. It's, the, it's what changed my life was um, several years ago. Uh, I was coming off of the biggest failure of my life uh, as a, at least in, at least in my career um, where the movie that I had made, the, the, the opportunity that I had had to do a big Hollywood production that was in theaters all over the country uh, that had given the promise of more projects like that faith-based projects with some of the biggest producers in Hollywood. And it just completely bombed. And in one day, within just a couple hours, I went from being a director with a very bright future to being a director with no future because all of those companies uh, that were committed to doing more projects with me just pulled out obviously. And so I'm home alone with my wife and we're crying and we're praying and confused because as I'm sure you've experienced, sometimes you feel there's a difference between having your own vision and dream and, and you're really pushing forward on it and you have no idea whether God is part of it or not. 
and that between that and a calling that you really feel like God is blessing and opening doors for you. And there's things happening that make it clear. This is God and not you. And, um, and, and you also feel maybe it's even the Lord's voice or, or an impression on your heart that this is right. And we had felt that multiple times. And then when it fails, you go, Oh, well then I guess it must not have been God. I guess I must've been wrong. I guess I didn't hear God's voice or, uh, wasn't following the right path. And so that was what we were re re wrestling with because, you know, you're always told God's not the author of failure and here we were failing. And so in the midst of that pain and confusion, my wife comes to me, I was in the kitchen getting something and she comes in and she says, God is putting it so powerfully on my heart, like as clear as an audible voice, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And so we went to our Bible and, and opened it up and read the story again, even though I'd heard it, you know, hundreds of times. And we noticed something that we hadn't noticed before, which was that the, 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 the spotlight of when we were reading the story, the spotlight this time was on the fact that Jesus wasn't surprised by the need. Um, and in fact, depending on your theology, you could say he either caused it or allowed it. But the fact that they were so desperate and hungry was in a sense, his fault. He's the one who'd been preaching for three days. And so these people are so hungry, they're desperate. And the disciples come to Jesus and they say, we need to send uh, these people home to get food because they, they're hungry. And Jesus, instead of going, oh, wow, good point. Yeah, we should do that. He goes, oh, well, we can't send them home. They're so hungry. They'll faint along the way. He knew how hungry they were and in fact had caused their hunger. And so he brought them intentionally to the place where they were so hungry, the only thing to feed them was a miracle. It's similar to the um, the, the story of the Red Sea, you know, where, where God told the Israelites, go camp out at the edge of the mm -hmm. Red Sea. It's not like he said, go there and then we'll talk. He was like, camp out there. You're going to be there for a while. I want you to set up camp. And then, of course, gets to the point where the Egyptians are bearing down on them and and the only thing left is a miracle to get them out of it. So God put these people in that state of hunger. And we're thinking, okay, just because we're at this state of desperation right now doesn't mean that God wasn't in it. So that was a comforting thought of maybe God put us here and and for a reason. And, and so what we think is going to happen, this is where the impossible math comes in uh, that you mentioned, is another phrase that God had put on my wife's heart was, I do impossible math. So we're thinking, huh, the feeding of the 5,000 is about to happen. The math that Hollywood typically goes by, God is going to completely upend it, upend it. And these box office numbers that are so bad right now are going to change. And that night, that didn't happen. In fact, the numbers got worse, which it was almost like God was saying, this is not the point. Um, is it, you know, I'm, I, you know what, what you're hearing is correct, but your conclusion is wrong. And so I, we're just confused. And I'm, I'm wondering what this is all about. And that night, I'm on my computer at four in the morning, doing what I do really well. Um, and again, you're a, you're, you're a professional athlete. So you understand this after a bad performance or a loss, uh, even more than a win, you're going to do a postmortem. You're going to get, you're going to, you're going to analyze what did I do wrong? What was wrong with my swing? What was wrong? How did I, you know, that, that, that one uh, point, uh, you know, I played it. How did I not, how did our preparation not match up with the execution? And that was what I was doing with this. And I'm pretty good at it. So I'm writing this 15 page memo, analyzing everything that had gone wrong and putting blame on myself to be fair. And, um, and out of the blue just pops up on my screen, this Facebook message from someone I had never met. It was a friend on Facebook that I knew randomly, but uh, we, we'd been in touch maybe once a year. We weren't close and it didn't say hi. It didn't say hello. It just said, remember your job is not to feed the 5,000. Your job is only to provide the loaves and fish. <laughs> and I, I even get emotional thinking about it now because it was, I've told, even though I've told this story many, many times, but I, I honestly, for a moment, looked around wondering if my computer had been recording what we'd been talking about. Because I'm thinking, how in the world could he know how, the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and what I'm wrestling with and how I'm confused and we don't know what the message of this story is for us right now. And so he just delivers the message. And I... I responded by saying, before I answer you or before I say anything, can I just ask, like, why did you send that to me? Like, what, what are you doing up at four in the morning? 
And he says, well, I'm on a different time zone. I'm on the other side of the, of the world. I'm in Romania um, visiting my brother. And I go, can I just ask you why you sent that? And he goes, oh, that wasn't me. God told me to tell you that. And I come to find out later, you know, that that God had really laid it on his heart to say this. And and uh, he had initially resisted, but uh, but then ultimately just did it because God told him to. And in that moment, my life changed um, dramatically. I became a different person, or at least I became someone committed to being a different person. And that has held up, which is I was a results-oriented person. I was someone who cared about and felt responsible for um, the results, including in ministry. Because if a ministry is not going well, meaning there's not the impact, uh, then you got to go, okay, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Or in a business uh, uh, situation or a sports situation, um, if you're if the results aren't there, you got to rethink everything, including the process. And I just realized, okay, as long as I'm doing what God wants, as long as I, when I give God loaves and fish that he deems worthy of acceptance, the transaction's over. What happens after that point is not up to me and not something, or at least even if, even if I have some hand in it, it's not mine to become my identity. Um, it's the results are, are, can be, can be learning, can be learnings, but they're not identity. And so that was something that was very different for me and something I wish I wouldn't have had to learn in my forties. And so in that moment, I just go, okay, from now on, God, I am willing to do anything and I'm willing to not do what I want to do if it means being in your will. And for the first time in my life, I gave up um, my obsession with, with movies and TV and, and, and my own vision. And I just said, I'll do whatever you want. And if that means not making another movie or TV show, I'll do that. And I believe that's when God said, that's not, now you're ready for the chosen. Um, because of course I had no idea that the chosen was coming. Um, and that ultimately led to me doing this short film on my friend's farm in Illinois, 20 minutes from my house at the time, uh, for my church's Christmas Eve service about the birth of Christ from the perspective of the shepherd. And it didn't even feel like five loaves and two fish fish. It felt like one loaf and half a fish. It was such a huge step down from the big Hollywood opportunity that I'd had that, um, you know, I just, but, but, but at the time I was just like, all right, loaves and fish. It's not my job to worry about this. I'm just going to do what God wants. It was clearly you know, God's hand in that. And while I was making it is when I came up with the idea for the chosen and the idea of doing a, a multi-season show, as opposed to just a movie and a, the idea for exploring the lives of the disciples with the biblical, cultural and historical context, you don't normally get from a movie or don't normally get from just reading one passage of scripture. And, um, and so that's when I, uh, had that idea, but of course it didn't make sense. And cause no one was lining up around the block to do a Jesus project and certainly not with me. And so to bring this very long story to a close, um, my short film got in the hands of a streaming platform at the time that was looking for content, heard about my idea for the show. They said, we really want to make your show. We really want to get behind it. I got really excited. And they said, we're going to raise the money through crowdfunding. And I got really depressed <laughs> because <laughs> crowdfunding never works. And it's, and uh, the all-time crowdfunding record was almost $6 million based on projects that had huge fan bases. And I had no fan base and certainly no chance of raising millions of dollars. And um, six months later, we're sitting at a computer and that short film, which had gone out uh, because I had decided, all right, loaves and fish, not my job to worry about the results. And uh, when that had generated $10 million from 16,000 people around the world, shattering the all-time crowdfunding record, I'm sitting there at the computer and I look over at my wife and she's got tears streaming down her face. And I'm like, what, what what's up? And she says, uh, I do impossible math. And um, it was the, it was God putting it on her heart just as clearly as he had the first time. This time he was saying, that's what I meant. Um, I do impossible math and, 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 you know, things might not look like you expect them to look like. And even when you hear my voice, sometimes you think what the conclusion might be and what I might mean. And you just need to be patient and it will be revealed to you. And, and, uh, and that we've been on that journey since then, uh, things that don't quite make sense and the success of the show and the impact the show is having on people in every country in the world is so clearly bigger than I am. And so clearly better than I'm capable of, uh, that even the use of me, to, to, to accomplish this work is, uh, is impossible math. That's such a great story. And I think that's why there's a story um, underneath the story. So there's the chosen story, but then there's your story of how it even came to be, why, why people are, are embracing it so much. And, and I also want to say the chosen is, has fans who are of Christian faith, non-believers, people of a variety of beliefs worldwide. And I want to reemphasize that, that the chosen is welcoming for all to enjoy. 
And just a few days ago, I was walking in town and I had my get used to different shirt on. The vice president of Little Star helped me with the foundation, helped me with the setup. We didn't have room to put this one on, but so this, I had this shirt on and I was walking through town. And and so th this group of people came over up to me and, and they said, you know, they, they said, are you a fan of The Chosen? And I was like, yeah. And so we, we started talking and they said they had a friend that had watched every season, every episode. This is all through season four, which is current six times, six times. And so we kept talking and right now, um, you have still seasons five and seven are upcoming, but these are the conversations. These are the things that are, are happening with the chosen. And, and Dallas, you know, I mentioned that you're dedicated to every stage of the project. You created the TV, TV series, you direct, co-write, co-produce, you're passionate about every step of the process. And that includes your connecting with audience members. After you say cut, you provide live streaming insights often addressing what does a life with God mean for you, how you have experienced miracles and how God speaks to you. You've experienced those three, having those same three profound relationship qualities with God since a child and ongoing throughout my life. How excited are you that The Chosen is helping be, build these relationship connections, these types of things, the topics and conversation points everywhere amongst all types of people? This has gone like what you were saying, it's beyond even the the TV series. People are stopping each other in the streets and having conversations they never used to have before like that. How is that for you? It must be so exciting. Yeah, I think that's actually the most exciting thing to see is, you know, we've said it from the beginning. The Chosen is not the end game. Um, you know, we're not going to be watching TV shows in heaven. Uh, the, the ultimate end game is worship and prayer and Bible reading and discipleship. But we're not responsible for that per se, meaning, you know, look, the, I understand that um, the majority of viewers are going to watch the show and then probably not have another touch point with us. They're going to watch it, whether they watch it on Amazon or Netflix or whatever, and they're, they're not going to go to our website. They're not going to go to our social media pages. They're not necessarily going to buy the the, the gifts that we offer, uh, which include Bible studies and devotional books. That's where my wife really comes into play. Uh, she's a discipler. And uh, she has written and, or co-written the majority of our Bible studies and devotional books and kids books and all that stuff. Um, so we know that. But for those who are interested in going deeper, for those who want to know more, for those who want to know what the end game is and participate in that, um, may, perhaps with us, not just in their local church, um, we want to provide those resources. We take that very seriously. And so we always say that the show is a supplement to our Bible studies and a supplement to the Bible, uh, not the other way around. Uh, it's not like the Bible is serving as just a supplement or, you know, uh, read the Bible so you can understand the show. That's not the case. Uh, it's watch the show and perhaps, hopefully, uh, and and the Bible can, can maybe come to life even more for you. Of course, the Bible has always been alive. Maybe you can come to life even more reading it. Or maybe, as many people have said, the Bible, which on paper had been somewhat black and white to them, becomes in, comes into color from watching the show, similar to how a sermon uh, can do that for you. Um, and so that's been so exciting is to see people saying millions of people, not, not, not just thousands, literally millions of people expressing to us that we're aware of and we're not aware of everybody saying, I'm reading my Bible more than ever because of the show. I'm I'm more passionate in church. I'm praying more than ever because of the show. Now, if people were saying, now because of the show, I don't have to read my Bible. I could get everything I need from the show. It's so great. Thank you so much, Dallas. Uh, that would not be good news to us, uh, no matter how much money they provided to support it or how much promotion they did on social media. That would be bad news. Um, but what we're hearing is the opposite, which is awesome. And that's been the most exciting thing is in, all over the world in multiple languages and countries, people telling us, walking up to us and saying, um, I, my life has changed and I'm more engaged with scripture than I've ever been because of it. And that's awesome. We know that's not true of everybody. Um, but for those who, who God is working in their hearts and for, in, for whatever role we can have in that process, we're excited to have it. That's terrific. I have a few more questions I'm inspired to ask. Before that, Karen is going to join us. Karen has experienced the polar extremes in life, having had an only 2% chance of survival from childhood cancer, thriving, and later a heart-wrenching loss in her family. Throughout, Karen continues to share her beautiful heart, faith, and kind spirit with others. Your turn, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, Dallas. It's a pleasure meeting you. It's an honor, too. Um, well, I would say that you actually answer all my questions <laughs> in your first question. <laughs> and I was like, well, should I even <laughs> ask anymore? <laughs> but ask the but, one about the failure yeah, go one, ahead, too. Though. Yeah, definitely ask the, the failure one again, because that's, <laughs> that's so important for people to know that sometimes people stop at the failure. And and so go ahead, go for it, Karen. Just have a, okay, have well, a chat. <laughs> I will. I will ask both. So okay. um, maybe he can go a little bit deeper in both. Um, <laughs> so the first one was, how was The Chosen born? What inspired it? And what made you want to make it into a show rather than a movie? So I, you did say something about doing like a little clip and then it, it went, but can you maybe go further more into how it really yeah. was born. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to your point about a show versus a movie, yeah, I touched on it a little bit, but um, the, a TV show allows you to go episode to episode, season to season. And the thing that really inspired me about it was I was binge watching multiple shows with my wife. We love TV. We watch, we binge watch stuff all the time. And I was seeing certain shows that I was like, man, the thing that keeps me coming back is the love of the characters. Um, I want to know what happens to them. It's not just the plot. And sometimes Jesus projects, movies or miniseries will go from miracle to miracle, Bible verse to Bible verse. And I hope you uh, don't just play this as a clip that you allow me to expand on what I mean by this, because it could sound bad. Jesus isn't a good main character for a drama. Um, in any drama in any TV show or movie or, or whatever, the main character, the protagonist is supposed to be someone who has a flaw and then overcomes that and learns something, or they have a goal and then they accomplish it. Um, and they have hurdles along the way that, that, that they have to overcome and they have to learn something about themselves. Well, Jesus is perfect. Of course, he has nothing to learn. Um, we know that the Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature, but, but, you know, as a, as a lead character, he doesn't make, there's not a lot of drama. And so you're watching Jesus movies and miniseries and you're, there's something different than there is when you watch a normal show or movie. And there's a reason why most people would tell you if asked, even strong believers, what's your favorite movie of all time or your top 10 movies of all time? Very, very few people would mention any Jesus projects. Jesus projects tend to feel a little bit like something you do because you're a Christian and you like it, and it's good to be reminded of these stories and to see them acted out, but you're not having the same emotional, visceral experience, and even sometimes a spiritual experience that you would have uh, in, in other projects. So a TV show allows us to explore other characters and to see Jesus through their eyes. And so if you can identify with these characters and love them and see things through their eyes, the change that they experience can also be yours. So we refer to it as the before. We show you who Simon was before he met Jesus, who Mary Magdalene was before she met Jesus. And in the Bible and in most projects about Jesus, you're only seeing that, that, that uh, entrance, that, that, meeting point. So you're seeing Jesus walks along, he sees a blind man, he heals him. Jesus encounters Mary Magdalene, she used to have demons in, in her, uh, and now she becomes this follower of Christ. Um, and so it's hard to connect with those characters, um, or those, well, they're not characters, they're real people. And so what we give you is this using, yes, cultural con context, yes, uh, historical context, and yes, artistic imagination. We're, we're allowing you to see the story through their eyes and identify with it. So if you can identify with their problems and their questions and their concerns, then you can identify with the solution. And so you, for example, you have had pain and, and fear and uh, desperation. And, you know, as, as Andrea said, you know, little chance to live. Well, we show you characters in the chosen that are in the same boat. And, and so if you can identify with them and say, okay, I, yes, I've been through that. Wow. This, J Jesus has answers for me, just like he had answers for them. Uh, that's very powerful. And it makes for good drama. And ultimately, at the end of the day, our, sh our job is to make a good television show. Um, and so that's where it was born. Um, and and that that process started when I was a kid, when I was in Sunday school. And they're doing little philanograph, or they're doing the little stories. And I was going, what would it have been like to, to play a game with Jesus? You know, what would it have been like <laughs> to be his friend at school? And uh, to, to lose every argument because he's always right about everything. You know, I used to just think about those things and jokes and what that would be like. And so that's that was kind of the impetus for the show. That's very good. And it's true. Um, I'm a visual person. So sometimes just reading the Bible by itself is like, oh, well, I don't really understand what he meant by this. Right. But then sometimes my dad used to have this collection of movies like, you know, the Christian movies about uh 
Ruth and uh, Esther and you know and I would really I really like the the story of Queen Esther for yeah. some reason so I would watch it and then I would read the story and then I could like picture it in my head and it would make more sense so yes yeah, I totally get that and I, I see your point so yes I really like that how you you portray that so I think that really helps too so thank you that's for awesome. sharing that <laughs> so no, now awesome. yes so now the other question was your 2017 movie, The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. I believe you described it as your biggest career failure. And now I was going to ask to tell us how it affected you and how you were able to overcome it. And you went into it for a, a bit. Um, you spoke about your wife and yourself, but how it affected you personally and how were you able to overcome it? Like, yeah, also personally. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I did get into a detail about what we went through in that day and, and how it changed me in some ways. But uh, The Resurrection of Gavin Stone is the name of the movie. It's, I think it's still on Netflix currently. Um, and it's a, it's a movie I'm proud of, and it has a wonderful message. And a lot of people liked it, but it failed uh, at the box office, and it failed financially. And and that's how you're measured in Hollywood. And the biggest thing is, m m what, and I think anyone who's listening, I hope, can really grasp this, is that what the world deems as successful or not, or how we tend to measure impact is just not how God measures uh, impact. And in some cases, sometimes God calls you to something and he doesn't care about the impact either. He's doing it for you. He's got something specifically for you. And that's something that I really have learned from doing The Chosen and all of my study of Jesus, and I think when you watch the show, you'll feel this, is the intimacy of God, the intimacy of these moments when Christ is calling someone or healing someone or even rebuking someone. It's specific to them. It's not just one size fits all. Now, salvation, obviously, the eternal, the, the things of eternity are are uh, are uni universal, meaning that 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 Jesus obviously is. There's one way to heaven. There's one way to salvation. Um, but when it comes to how He communicates to you and how your how, how the Holy Spirit works inside you, it's unique to each person, and that applies to um, to what I learned in this five and two situation, where I was like, okay, sometimes God calls you to something, and it's and even though. The results might not be significant, and, you, and and there might be other people involved in it, and that there might be a failure. Uh, he might have had something specifically for you that he wanted you to learn, and that was something that I really uh, came out of the resurrection of Gavin Stone. Going, um, God didn't care as much about the movie I was making or the results of it or what I was doing for him. He cared about what I was doing with him, and that's a huge life lesson. And I think sometimes we should write this on our mirror is God doesn't care what you do for him. He cares what you do with him. Um, and you know, he, now obviously sometimes he cares about what you do for him too. I'm just saying that <laughs> he, he wants, he wants to, you to be with him. He, he wants to be part of the process and the results. He doesn't need you uh, to, to, to bring about some sort of result. He can do the results without you. Um, but he wants to, to bring about something with you because um, that's that's why he has a relationship with you. And so those are the things that really have stood out to me. And, and in our company, for the five years, we've lived up to this. I mean, for the last five, six years, like we preach to ourselves constantly, the five and two principle of, um, you know, the numbers don't, the numbers can, can teach us, but they're not our identity. Um, and, uh, you know, success can be um, exciting, but it's not the end game. You know, it's not, the, it's not, uh, it's not the motivation um, and failure uh, is a learning, not a devastation. And so those are things that we really, really uh, try to, try to practice. Yes. And I really like what you said that um, sometimes we have to be uh, uh, a little bit more dependent on God and, and see what he has to say. And sometimes we don't understand what, you know, failure can mean, but it could be a good thing. So Oh, absolutely. Especially, especially coming from him, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And God does, you know, again, we, the, the phrase, God isn't the author of failure. It sounds good. I, I'm not sure it's totally true. I think sometimes God intentionally yeah. puts us in situations 
now he's not the author of long-term failure of eternal exactly. failure of course <laughs> but he can be he can use failure or even bring it about in order to teach us something that's far more significant than what we dis, than than what we see as failure or success i truly agree yes thank you thank you for that thank you <laughs> Now, Dallas, you and I grew up in the Chicago area. Your dad, the prolific Jerry Jenkins, wrote over 200 books, including the successful Left Behind series. Your dad did a kindness for me over 20 years ago. He knew about my Children's Cancer Foundation, how I gave all my millions of dollars of pro tennis earnings to help children with cancer and children in need worldwide. Your dad invited me to see him speak at Trinity Divinity College outside of Chicago, a college as a child I have fond memories of hanging out at. It was located next to a tennis club I trained at before I became a professional tennis player at the age of 14. Whenever they were looking for me to practice, I was always over just watching the students there and sitting in the chapel. It was just the coolest thing. So when your dad was speaking there, he knew about that and he invited me. So it was um, a really great kindness that he did. And, and being part of that special speech and ceremony still resonate with me. That same trip from over two decades ago, I had a speaking event in Chicago for a book I wrote. I wanted to call my book Soli Deo Gloria. The publisher decided on first service following God's calling and finding life's purpose. From that book experience, I know the work that goes into writing, editing, publishing, and promoting a book. A TV series is massively more involved. How much did it help you having a dad that was generous of spirit to countless others, even strangers, enormously successful, hardworking in a field that has ups and downs, and throughout, passionately faithful to God and a fan of mainstream movies? Yeah, that was huge for me. And I think the biggest thing that I learned was how he did handle success. Now, I didn't know at the time that I would have a project like The Chosen that by worldly measures was even more successful and than left behind. Um, but I, I got a firsthand seat at when he experienced this massive overnight, seemingly overnight success. Um, it didn't make him more arrogant. It didn't make him feel responsible. It did the opposite. It brought him to his knees. It made him even more humble. It made him realize, wow, I'm not this good. I mean, multiple New York Times bestsellers all at the same time. That is not something that I'm capable of. And uh, it made him even more dependent on God. Uh, and so that notion that I experience now, like right now I'm putting the finishing touches on the scripts for season five. And when I'm sitting in front of a blank computer screen, the blank computer screen does not care how successful the previous season was. It does not care how much impact there's been all over the world. It does not care about um, how difficult my life has been from doing The Chosen and how much better it's been from doing The Chosen because of the, the success and the, the fame and even the financial uh, blessings that have come from this. Uh, that none of that matters when you're, when you're uh, facing the blank screen. And I know I keep bringing back the tennis analogies, but... Uh, when you when, when you start the new match, uh, and uh, you know, let's say you make it to the finals of of a of a big tournament, how big your victory was in the semifinals is now completely irrelevant. You're starting from scratch, and uh, you a, a new injury could come. Um, you could you could have uh, gotten sick in the in the night before. You could have you could be distracted. You could be nervous. All of these things still happen. Uh, the journey is never over. And uh, that the same is true with the chosen. I saw that with my dad, with Left Behind, and, and with his, his whole careers, as he remained, as the Bible says, hand to plow. Um, he kept doing the work. He was focused on that. He wasn't focused on the success. And like I said, the success was a nice measurement. It was it was something to learn from, and it's fun to celebrate. I'm not I'm not uh, inhuman. I mean, I still love getting awards. It's fun and seeing our movie or you know in 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 the box finishing the high at the box office, that's, that's enjoyable. And it's a nice reward um, for it, but it's not what uh, defines me. I saw firsthand my dad's humility, his dependence on God uh, in the midst of success for a uh, an artistic endeavor. And that was a great learning, uh, learning experience for me uh, going through this now. It's a super important to mention too, is that, you know, a lot of people are learning things from their failures, which is so obviously important, but when you can also learn from your successes and how to be and, and, and seeing your dad and that he was, he was amazing throughout. And, and I was always grateful for that visit and it, I cherish it to this day, always will. And so, um, but here's something that I wanted to bring up and I'm going to throw in kind of a, a tennis and an injury thing. Cause you just brought that up as well, but to help audience members who may be struggling, I come to this subject next. It can be tough when a person is misunderstood or mocked for whatever reason is different about them. Beliefs included sufferings can culminate, but still allowing space for the experiencing of joy. 
I bring up these things in, in personal ways so audiences know it's not always been easy for any of us. It's an everyday continuing process. And you talked about that, that blank page is so important. Because of my prodigy tennis talents, knowing my callings, which includes my Little Star Foundation being on its 39th year, and my steadfast friendship with God since a child, I became used to and comfortable being called different. God's infinite source of joy always prevailed in glorious stepping stone moments, from whether I was playing Billie Jean King on center court Wimbledon, to even when I was injured on the pro tennis circuit, and a famous reporter came up to me and said, you will never amount to anything ever again if you don't get back on the tennis court. I was still a teenager at the time, and I knew God had big plans of service callings for me far beyond tennis. Faith and joy prevailed, as it does for each of us in all seasons. When I first started my children's foundation, a pro athlete told me it was stupid for me to give all my pro tennis earnings to help children with cancer because I would end up broke and the kids would die anyway. I kept faith God would send people that felt the same importance and urgency I did of giving, of charity, of opening up of the heart to be of service to God with God. A few decades after that happened with that person, Nelson Mandela visited me to say thank you for my humanitarian work. And so I bring up these little things, as, as you mentioned, is everybody has those stories. If you keep faith and you keep going with God, God is working with you all the time. So now, even more decades later, God still finds people to show up and help, knowing it's stepping stone gifts for us all. We're all on the same team, just a different evolving processes. So I understand Suffering is not the worst thing that can happen. Disobedience to God is. And it's same for Psalms 34, 5, which is those that look to God with radiant joy should never be ashamed. So That's you my handle- favorite verse. It's my favorite Bible verse. <laughs> it's that, so great. It's so great. That is, literally, it- that is literally my favorite Bible verse when people ask, those who look to him are blameless. Their, their, their faces shall never be ashamed. Because it's talking about when you're looking at God. Now, that doesn't yes. mean that you are blameless and never ashamed your entire life. But when you're looking at God, uh, then, uh, th- then you know that um, that like if you are focused on on him, then there's that yeah. It, you keep going. I just wanted to say you. No, have to that is so that great because it's it's part of what I bring up next, which you handle your struggles and the recent massive outpouring of media and audience reactions, all you know, positive ones, whatever ones that come in. If people are are just asking questions that you want them to ask, you handle them all the same. If you have no reactions. You're just grateful to be doing what you're doing. You're humble and generous and sharing that you have a mission from God and you are following it. You know, every day is a new day, new opportunity, new stepping stone to present the best God has called you on. You are comfortable with being different. Profound in the teaching of Jesus is faith and joy exist for the choosing, as is getting used to being different. You include include in the chosen season one, episode seven, where Jesus statement and sentiment, get used to different. Please share your thoughts for anyone who is struggling on the Jesus teaching of get used to different because it is personal for each person. And it in watching the chosen, you you do, you feel comfortable being who you are because you watch the disciples grow from that beginning stages and and they they still, it's not as if they recovered a hundred percent. Some of them still have the the doubts and the 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 losses and the you know, why is so-and-so being healed and I'm not being healed? You know, there's those things still occur throughout, but how, um, how would you share that? And if someone's yeah. struggling with that. And uh, to be clear, and you know, this, of course, the words get used to different aren't in the Bible. That was a phrase yes, that I had Jesus, <laughs> that Jesus say to, to, to Simon when he's asking, you know, why Jesus would call a tax collector like Matthew and put him onto this team. And, and Jesus is like, well, you didn't, you were surprised when I called you too. And Simon's like, well, this is different. I'm not a tax collector. And Jesus is like, get used to different. Uh, we believe that that phrase is plausible and that it fits the character and intentions of Jesus in the Gospels uh, because of the fact that um, Jesus' whole ministry was kind of an upsetting of the apple cart. Um, and here's the thing. Uh, you covered a lot of ground in your question, but uh, w- the thing that I focus on throughout this entire process is that I'm not motivated to avoid criticism or to gain praise. Right now, you can go on YouTube and search for Dallas Jenkins, and you will see dozens of videos with millions of views calling me a heretic and 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 quoting me wrongly and having headlines, clickbait headlines that aren't accurate and saying things about the show that that uh, that are you know that are that are rooted in inaccuracies or things that are out of context. And you can also see videos and and posts that are about how great I am and how great the show is and how it's changed your life and how I'm the greatest director ever. 
I'm not motivated or shaken or turned left or right by either of those things. And I think that's really important. And the get used to different principle is, listen, if you're going to be called to something that is unique and requires you to remain faithful to God regardless, which of course, I think the Christian life in general is that way, but specifically things like you, you, you talked about your, your, your foundation, you're going to get criticized for it. You're going to get praised for it. Um, I would, I, I would imagine that when you first started the foundation, you didn't expect someone to tell you it's a waste of time, but you also didn't expect Nestle Mandela to come up to you and thank you for it. Exactly. If, that's <laughs> if, that's, if that would have been your goal, um, I guarantee you would have been distracted and I guarantee you probably would have made decisions that weren't God led. And the same thing is true of the chosen. I can't be motivated by gaining praise or avoiding criticism. I can't be motivated by the things that the world tends to be motivated by. I have to remain focused on uh, pleasing God, following his calling. And uh, and my job with the chosen is, uh, it's multifaceted, but it's all right. I, I, my job is to make a good show, uh, to make an entertaining, watchable show, which is very hard to do, to uh, to honor God, to fit within the character and intentions of Jesus and the Gospels, uh, so that I don't ever stray, even when I'm doing things that aren't directly from Scripture, that it feels plausible, that it feels like this is within God's character um, and within the intentions of the Gospels. And uh, if I can do that, if I can get to the end of seven seasons and say, I did that, uh, I, I stayed faithful to the calling, I stayed faithful to the intentions of this show, and I didn't go outside that uh, circle of plausibility and and, and accurately reflecting God's character— that will be success. Um, and it's similar to your, in any foundation that, or the foundation that you've done or any ministry or work or even non, non, uh, non-ministerial work that you do. If you can define for yourself what success truly is, and it's not what the world defines as success, if it's staying faithful to God's calling while protecting, you know, pro- providing for your family and making sure that you're not, of course, you know, <laughs> destitute in the streets, um, unless God calls you to that too, that he might do that. So who knows? But the point is, if, if, if you are remaining faithful to that calling, if you can get to the place where you genuinely don't care what others think of you, as long as you are within God's will, and that's a place I've gotten to now, of course, you know, knock on wood or hand to God. I hope that I always remain there. And if I ever stray from that, may God have mercy on my soul. But I'm saying genuinely, when you get to that place where you don't care what others think of you, and it takes time, especially for someone like me who used to be motivated by um, success and affirmation um, and and pleasing others was a big thing in my life, but started replacing those urges with scripture. Scripture like 35, Psalm 34, 5. You can, be, you can change. And if you get to that place, it is a superpower. And again, you, and to use a sports analogy, I, I don't know if this was true for you. I don't know you well enough to know, but you've seen players who play with abandon, who play with... I don't, you know, even in a big moment or a, or a set point or a match point where all the nerves should be there, I'm actually, I'm actually okay because, uh, and I'm not tight because I'm not doing this to try to get cheers from the crowd. Um, those are the most dangerous players and difficult players to play against. And, uh, and in, and in this business, um, if you can, if you can truly get to a place where you're not motivated by the money or the fame or the success, man, it becomes a superpower because you're just focused on doing what God wants. And that's every, obviously we know with Jesus and the disciples there, they become these superheroes in a sense for kids to look up to. And, and I was so excited to ask you that question because you are in a way too. I mean, when, when, you know, hopefully kids growing up, they look at different things and they see different things to model their behavior at, and to know that you've had this success and, and what is your core being, your relationship with God? You know, what is my life with God? And and that has continued with success. I, um, you know, I we've both grown up with different people and seeing different successes. And when you see people and they stay true to the core, that their relationship with God is still the most paramount, the most centered, the most everything in their life, regardless of what's happening, it's, it is, it's a superpower and it's such a great thing to have. So thank you for for sharing that with um with audiences. So every season of the chosen celebrates, reflects and connects with scriptures. Wonderfully the holy spirit is evident and present in each season. There's a building up of each episode. Among fascinating storytelling includes teachings that flow effortlessly, including 
And I'm going to just share a couple of things. There's not going to be a question on this part so we can get to the question, but it's really cool for people who haven't seen this. They can get excited about this. Like season one is highlighting childlike faith and the miracles of the fish. Season two, Jesus says, and, and again, this is um, a sharing from the creative um I don't mastery of Dallas, but strong passion can be a good thing when it is for righteousness. Season three includes indescribable compassion, feeding of the 5,000, the parable of the mustard seed. Season four, Jesus addresses grief, complex emotions, even being vulnerable, having knowingness and what to do with it. So, the, you know, everyone, seriously, if we haven't said enough about the chosen, go, go watch. <laughs> but I want to bring up something else that's very dear to your heart as well. And it's a project ongoing uh, that's coming out. It's the best Christmas pageant ever due out this Christmas season, 2024. Congratulations on that longtime passion project of your and your wife's. If you could summarize that soon to be out movie in, in like a scripture or teaching, what would that be? I mean, each season... And I didn't even, you know, I just highlighted one tiny little bit of each season. Every episode has something very profound to bring. But in that movie, it is such a, it's a passion project of yours. What would be, if you had to pick a, like a teaching or a scripture, yeah, what yeah. would, what would that be with? Yeah, I'm not, I, 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 a scripture doesn't immediately come to mind, but this, this teaching or this concept does. I remember when I first read the book, um, my wife and I were weeping. I mean, I'd read it as a kid, but I didn't remember all of it, but we were just weeping because of this notion that you get closer to the heart of God and to the story of the Gospels and the story of Christ's birth through poverty and disadvantage and underprivilege uh, than you do through wealth, prosperity, and power. And that is such a radical concept. The, the, the best Christmas pageant ever is this wonderful story. It's a comedy, um, of course, and it's it's some people. a lot of people have seen the play or they've read the book or they've seen the TV movie from the 80s where it's very, very funny, very witty. And it's about this group of kids who are from the wrong side of the tracks and they're considered the worst kids in the world. And they take over this church's Christmas pageant and play all the roles. And um, and, and it's going to be a disaster because they're, they're so ignorant of the story and they're just ruining everything. But then when it comes time to actually perform it, their unique perspective on it actually brings people closer to the heart of the true story. And we, those of us in, uh, in privilege or in... Uh, in wealth or power or prosperity or or comfort or tradition even, that can get in the way of the actual true story of the nativity. And it's through these chi this childlike faith uh, th and this innocence, uh, the kids the kids weren't innocent by worldly standards, but they didn't know the story. And so they were just asking all these questions and and figuring it out and seeing it through their underprivileged, uh, poverty stricken eyes. And they actually got closer to the heart of the story than the, uh, the traditional folks did. And that is such a beautiful message. And in fact, it's in many ways, the heart of the chosen. So many people, when they watch the chosen go, wow, I never thought of it that way. Or this feels so real and authentic and human. And it takes these people, Jesus and his disciples down from stained glass windows, down from paintings, down from, um, from statues. And it, uh, and it, it re reminds you that they were living, breathing human beings who suffered and questioned, you know, uh, Jesus didn't, of course, but but they suffered and were in pain. Uh, Jesus suffered, but he didn't have questions, of course, but he, they, they were suffering and, and in pain and had, had uh, struggles and persecution and um, like we do. And uh, that's the, the heart of the chosen. And that's the heart of the best Christmas pageant ever. That's a great story. I love that. In episode three, when Jesus commissioned the disciples two by two to go out, it wasn't the easiest of tasks. Even Jesus became frustrated. The disciples had confusion, sufferings, losses, but faith and joy prevailed with good news evident in the present and in the bigger picture. Ones, twos, and multitudes continue to be called forth with faith in divinely orchestrated friendships and missions with the veil of God's love embracing throughout, regardless of adventure. Honoring God and showing gratitude of such, like how you in season four let Jesus discuss there is no one way to express grief. There's also more than one way to honor and show gratitude to God. One of my recent experiences of God, my gratitude and summary of it resulted in my saying, thank you, it is you. Every time I say those words, I feel God's anointing, the ever constant companionship, peace and passion are present for the mission. You have experienced God's communication. What words of gratitude come to you when connecting to one of your God and Red Sea type experiences? Yeah, your questions are so thorough. I love this. Um, yeah, there's so many moments in The Chosen where the 
followers of Jesus are realizing, oh, <laughs> this is this is so different and and yet ultimately better than what I was expecting. And they had expectations for the Messiah. They had expectations for what their lives would look like once the Messiah arrived and how overcoming the Romans and and uh, having earthly success and healing and, and lack of persecution were what they assumed was going to happen. And uh, when they saw the bigger picture and when they, like there's a, there's a line from Mary Magdalene in season two, episode three, where she says, um, I don't think he's, waiting for us to be holy. He's here because we can't be holy without him. And that is that that truth should should result in gratitude. Um, gratitude is uh, I'm about to give a phrase that my former pastor used to say. Uh, gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for life. <laughs> and and so uh, there's there's a gratitude that comes from realizing your own, sin and your own pain and your own need for a savior um that that that, that is that is the 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 peace that passes all, all all understanding and so that's what you see throughout the show and that's hopefully the result that you get from watching the show and from realizing your own need for a savior and that it does look different from how you expected but that's so much better uh that 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 should result in a humility that can only come from gratitude absolutely now to close the chosen has become a global movement Thank you, Dallas. Gratitude to your wife, Amanda, your family, the chosen team, family, and audience. Enjoy the chosen, everyone. And remember the three, what we brought up. I mean, we brought up a lot of things, but um, there's a five and two, but this is different. The three of what does a life with God look like for you? Miracles are happening and God is communicating. We are each of the whole. Uh, Dallas, I was, I was hoping you in closing, you would share a prayer with me. I'm going to start it and you finish it. it. And maybe we can body like um, Psalms 34, 5, which we mentioned earlier, and then Proverbs 27, 9, whichever you feel inspired by. And for anyone with Proverbs 27, 9, it's being about sweet friendships, refresh the soul and make the heart glad. So I'm going to do the beginning part and then you're going to finish. So my beginning of the prayer is, dearest God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, holy, holy are you. Thank you. It's you. And oh, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, you just said thank you. I was going to say thank you. So I guess I'll just continue with that. But it's it's uh, thank you for the fact that um, that the successes that we are seeing and the impact that we may have is bigger than we are. Because when we are reliant on God and we are doing everything that we do in service to him, then we will see impact and results that are not only oftentimes bigger than we are, but different than we are. And I'm so thankful for that because if it was up to me and if it was, if it was reliant on me and if it looked like me, uh, it would be so small. And by small, I don't just mean um, small in numbers. I mean, small in vision, small in, um, an eternal impact. And so I'm grateful um, and uh, for, for Psalm 34, 5, uh, because I'm grateful for the, for the fact that um, if my eyes aren't on God, and if I was focused on my own learnings and my own practice and my own dependency, um, that uh, I, would, I would be in such a, such a lower and smaller situation than I'm in now. And I think that's true for everybody. And so I'm grateful to God. I'm grateful to you, God, for, for, uh, for that truth. Um, that your ways are not our ways. And because uh, if they were, <laughs> uh, we'd be in trouble. And so uh, that's what I'm grateful for, is that his ways are not our ways and that I get a chance to have a front row seat at what that looks like. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Dallas. <laughs> wow, this is just, this is so amazing. And certainly blessings and prayers and love to you and your wife, Amanda, and your family and, and the chosen team and and for all your projects. Um, you know, this is just, it's, it's not, it hasn't been your first and, uh, you've had many before and you're going to have many after. And so blessings to all your, your God called projects and callings and, and to the audience as well. And, and hope this, um, uh, nourishes their, their souls and their hearts and, and uh, more to come. So thanks again. <laughs> really thank, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Andrea. So wonderful to talk to you. God and bless. I'd love to your dad too. Absolutely. Um, yes. love to hear, yeah, give him a big hug for me. All right. Thanks Will again. Do.